Hey everybody, today we're getting into ANOVA. We'll talk about what it is, why it works, when you might want to use it, and when you might not want to use it. We're going to want to really hit the big ideas about this um, and not do too much of the arithmetic, but this will be a mathematical introduction to the concept of analysis of variance. So if you're just looking to plug numbers into SPSS, this isn't the vid for you. So we're talking about a situation where we have a bunch of different groups and we want to compare means within those groups. So maybe um, we're testing a different medication on people of different ages, or maybe we have a bunch of different medications and we want to know if they're all equally effective or ineffective. Here's the formal statement of the hypotheses that we're looking at. In particular, notice that it is a, just one big null hypothesis. We're just saying, are all of the means equal or are or are at least two of them different from one another. We're not specifically saying anything about where those differences might lie, in other words, which groups might be different. So at the end of all this, we're gonna have that as an open question, even in the case where we reject the null hypothesis. So given that that's the case, why should we even bother with analysis of variance? Why shouldn't we just go straight for it and start comparing the groups head to head, for example, using paired t-tests? or two sample t-tests. So the answer is the risk of false positives. Every t-test that you do, any statistical test you run, is going to have a, an error rate, a risk of rejecting the null hypothesis even when the null hypothesis is true. Um, we call that the significance level of the test, alpha. Typically 0.05 is used. If you run more than one statistical test, that probability of increases, the probability of at least one false positive. If you run just two t-tests, your probability becomes 0 0.0975. Of it. That's the probability of at least one false positive. Not great. If you have m groups and you want to compare them pairwise, you're going to have m choose two tests to run with a 5% error rate in each one, even just with four groups, you already have a probability of at least one false positive of over 26%, and it only grows from there. By the time you get to, to 15 or so, the probability of at least one false positive is near one. So clearly we need a better way to test this null hypothesis than, than just these two sample t-tests. Basic idea, we're gonna compare the variability within the groups, um, to the variability between the groups. And the idea is that um, if the variability between the groups is large in comparison to the variability within the groups, as shown here on the right, we're gonna have better evidence against the null hypothesis. Um, magically, when we construct the variability between the groups and the variability within the groups appropriately, the ratio has a, an F distribution, so we have um, the ability to compute in that distribution fairly easily. We'll be able to compute p-values and, and make decisions. So when can we run ANOVA? First of all, all the observations have to be independent. These truly have to be m random samples from different groups. If you don't have that satisfied, it's really a design issue and statistics isn't the best way to, to address that. Secondly, we assume that the response variable is normally distributed within each group. ANOVA is fairly robust against this, so if you have some violation of that, it's generally okay as long as your sample sizes are decent. Finally, we're assuming that the variance um, of the different groups, the variances of the different groups are equal. So um, the population variance I'm talking about there. If you don't have that, then you're probably thinking more in terms of some sort of non-parametric test that we're not gonna get into in this video. Here's the test statistic that we're gonna use. Um, I already said that it was uh, gonna be an F statistic, and so it's not surprising on the right to see some sort of ratio of variances. Here, N is the total sample size, M is the number of groups. We have to unpack what SSE and SST are. So very roughly speaking, SST is gonna measure the variability between the groups, and SSE is gonna measure the variability within the groups. Here are the official definitions. Um, SSE stands for error sum of squares. Sometimes we say residual sum of squares. Um, it really does look like a variance. It's gonna be um, a sort of variance of the data away from the sample mean of each group. 
the SST is the treatment sum of squares. It's representing the variability between the group. And there you're seeing some sort of weighted average of the difference between the sample means and the overall sample mean. So the sample mean within the groups and the overall sample mean. Um, when the null hypothesis is true, both of these things have chi-squared distributions. And so that's how we get that F statistic out of it. So actually analyzing variance. S squared, sample variance. The first thing we're going to do is multiply it by n minus 1. That gets rid of that denominator in the definition of our sample variance. That gives us that double summation that we have there on the right. Um, SS tot is going to be total sum of squares. So you're thinking about that as the total variability within the data set, um, very much playing the same role as, as the variance overall, just not averaged. It's a total, not an average. Um, magically, um, total sum of squares is going to end up equaling the error, the error sum of squares plus the treatment sum of squares. Here it is written algebraically. We'll dive into that math a little bit in a couple of slides. Right now, let's just see the picture. So here I've drawn, drawn um, a sample of size 18 broken into three groups. The error sum of squares is going to measure the variability, the distance from those dots to the respective sample means. Um, the treatment sum of squares is going to represent the distance between the sample means themselves. And then the total sum of squares represents if we pool all of that data together into one big data set, sort of what's the, what's the total variation in that set overall. Okay, so I'm going to move through the algebra pretty quickly, but I do want to have it here. It's worth, uh, um, since this is a, a mathematical introduction, it's worth doing. So there's the definition of the total sum of squares, the, the total variability in the data set. We're going to add and subtract the, um, the sample means in the different groups, regroup things by foiling things out, and then magically that bottom term, the third term in that summation is going to go away. So you can always pause this video and, and actually go through that algebra a little bit more closely. What you're seeing there at the bottom is actually the error sum of squares and the treatment sum of squares. So we do actually get the result we claimed we would get. Okay, and so now that we've justified the total sum of squares equals error sum of squares plus treatment sum of squares, we can actually analyze this relationship with a bit of a with a bit more of a clear conscience. Okay, so um, the total sum of squares is a scaled sample variance. And therefore, we should be able to use it as an estimator of population variance. To say that a little bit differently, if I take the total sum of squares, divide by the population variance, sigma squared, I'm really getting n minus 1 times the sample variance over the population variance. And so I'm going to have a random variable with a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. So that's great. The idea now is that we understand the left-hand side is a chi-square distribution. The left-hand side of the total sum of squares equals error sum of squares plus treatment sum of squares. We'd like to do the same thing with the right-hand side. So we're going to basically do the same procedure on each of the groups. We started by using the entire sample the variance of the entire sample to estimate the variance of the population. Now let's just use the variance of each of the individual groups. So here's variance for one of the individual groups, for the ith group. That's going to be an unbiased estimator of population variance. So if I multiply it by n sub i minus 1, divide it by the population variance, I get another chi-squared random variable. This one with only n minus 1 minus 1 degrees of freedom. Let's add all those up. Chi-squared um, distributions add. The sum of two chi-squared distributions is another chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom that add. Um, so the random variable I get when I add them all up is the error sum of squares. And it's going to have a chi-squared distribution with n minus m degrees of freedom because I'm adding up n sub i minus 1 across all the different groups and the sum of the n i is n. Let's get back to the big picture. We have this equation total sum of squares equal error sum of squares plus treatment sum of squares. Dividing everything by the population variance, we get 
to a situation where, when the null hypothesis is true, two of the three things are known to have chi-squared distributions. And it turns out that under those circumstances, the third one does as well. The treatment sum of squares over the population variance will be chi-squared with m minus 1 degrees of freedom. So if the null hypothesis is true, we're getting a ratio of chi-squared random variables. It's going to have an, um, an f distribution that we can compute in. Quick word about treatment sum of squares when the null hypothesis is false. So um, in that situation, the expected value of the treatment sum of squares is not just going to be m minus 1 times sigma squared in general. I don't want to go through this step by step. I encourage you to pause the video and look through the arithmetic here carefully. Um, we're doing an expansion of the the square there, collecting like terms, and then using the fact that we know some stuff about the expected value of sample means. The, the calculation continues, um, again collecting like terms, introducing some new notation. Again, I encourage you to pause the video to look at this step by step. I won't walk through it step by step, that makes for a pretty boring video. Overall, you get that the expected value of the treatment sum of squares is m minus 1 times the population variance plus some term that is never negative. Now that last summation will go away when the null hypothesis is true, in which case the expected value of the treatment sum of squares is m minus 1 times the population variance, exactly what we are hoping for. When the null hypothesis is false, we get something bigger than that. In other words, we get an f statistic that is greater than 1. Okay, enough of that let's actually apply this new f statistic that we have here. Here are the formulas. I want to use the data from this graph that I posted earlier when we were going through just the basic ideas of this. The null hypothesis is going to be that the population means are the same for each group. We'll use significance level alpha equals 0.05. Here's the data. Um, we need to compute the treatment sum of squares and the error sum of squares, scale them appropriately, um, take the ratio and then consider the probability of randomly getting an f statistic greater than that in the f distribution with n minus 1 and n minus m degrees of freedom. I don't want to spend a lot of time actually plugging into those formulas. In practice we do that using technology and um, actually doing it out by hand would just be painful to watch. Um, one last piece of vocabulary here, the numerator and denominator of the f statistic in this situation get called the mean squares. It's traditional to report the results of an analysis of variance using a ANOVA table, such as this one. We show degrees of freedom for each of the groups, the treatment and the error, um, the treatment sum of squares and the error sum of squares. We show the sum of squares themselves and the mean squares, the F statistic, and then finally the p-value. So of course that p-value is representing the probability of randomly getting an f statistic greater than or equal to 1.18 um, in that f distribution. So in this case that's clearly greater than our level of significance. There is not sufficient evidence to say that these groups have different population means. A quick word about what to do when you do reject the null hypothesis. So when you reject the null hypothesis, the conclusion is that at least one pair of the groups have different population means. We don't say anything about which groups those are. So the next logical step is to actually go back out and try and figure out which ones are different. It's still a bad idea to do um, two sample t-tests pairwise for all the reasons that we said before. Instead, you want to do some sort of specialized post hoc test after the fact test. Obviously, I'm not going to go into that in this video. The most common one to use is the Tukey test. Um, very roughly speaking, what you're doing is giving up some statistical power, demanding smaller p-values in your pairwise tests before you're willing to conclude that they are statistically, that their difference between them is statistically significant.